typically will be uh, you know, anchored in as usually a few centimeters or more. And uh, that's good, thanks. We can go on, we got some crabs. Okay, moving on. Um, but yeah, they, they've, they've taken to living in the sediment uh, rather than attached to hard substrate. So they're, they're just anchored in. They don't typically attach. Although there's some sea pens that have adapted to uh, hard substrate life with uh, kind of a suction cup modification to their peduncle. Can sea pens move? Can they move? Like, uh, yes. Yep. Yeah. Not like in this zone. Move you to wanna another place. Pitch away. Yeah. While we're no, they can. Well, they can move vertically. Also, I. Sorry. Tried to sample okay, some pitch previously, away. even you know. Sure. Either suction or you know trying to grab them. And I've had them just completely disappear on me, just <laughs> right down to the mud. Um, in fact, so uh, vertically and horizontally, yes? Um, horizontally, I don't know about. Uh, Has that been observed? I'm sure if they get knocked over, they can you know, upright so themselves, the but the I don't right know how mobile left. they are. Left I think side. they just uh, or, I don't know. usually stay in place. They pitched the, uh, yeah, they pitched the Got right it. side one, so yeah. pitch the left side oh, one. Man. Okay, tell so. you. Is it possible that your nightmare scenario of sea pens getting lost in the <laughs> slurper, maybe they just sort of <laughs> shimmy their way back out? Yeah, uh, I would like to think so. I'd like to think they're that smart. Here, here's a random fact about me. For a while, I thought I wanted to study sea pens just because I liked peduncle. <laughs> That's a good word. <laughs> Definitely a good word. Could see where where I try to choose what I want. <laughs> study. Fish have peduncles too, caudal peduncles. Yeah, but I'm more invertebrate marine biologist than. Caudal peduncle is one of my favorite phrases. Caudal peduncle. There are all sorts of new words on this uh, morning watch. Yeah. 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 Vocabulary squad. We could have our own crossword. Make our own wordle. Mm. I don't know how to play that yet. I haven't done any, any of those. I have not jumped on the wordle bandwagon yet okay. either. Bottom one. Top one. How about the one I just grabbed? Is it? Yeah, you want okay, to grab the bottom well, one. Our budding geologists have some more questions. Follow up. They want to know what causes the hot spots. So that again is something that has a couple different answers. Um, but sometimes you can have th an area of like thinner or weaker lithosphere. Um, Slow back down. To and so area. the heat is more pervasive in those areas. Um, What's that? Oh, right. There, you can also get uh, different, like, flow regimes in the mantle um, itself as well. So there are a couple different things, um, some that we don't necessarily understand. Um, but, yeah. Right. Well, there you go. There are also some that exist um, in conjunction with other kind of tectonically active areas like mid-ocean ridges. So as you have the spreading of two plates, that kind of facilitates um, the flow of heat and magma as well. So Iceland is an example of an area where a mid-ocean ridge and hotspot work in, like work together. Dang it. Is that not from the... That was in view there. Hold on, let me see if I can pull it back out. Oh, come on. See it just under the bar I there? I see it, I just... Oh, 
Oh, interesting comment coming in right now. I've seen microscope live streamers okay, put bingo the cards out with common creatures so viewers can play along. I think a bingo card for Nautilus is in development, so stay tuned. I'm pretty sure a science communication fellow project is working on that. So, great awesome. idea, and it is... Is that the top one? There in the mix. Is. We also have uh, Midwater Bingo yeah, yeah, and Seafloor so. Bingo already on the Nautilus Live website as well, and education okay. resources. Okay, hang on, I need to... Pull it there out. you go. Trying real hard not to punch that camera. You can see yourself in Argus too. I see that. Ah, uh, it's hung up on the. Hang on. Oops. Okay, that's. Hang on. You can pitch them both, I don't care. Don't worry about Argus, I got it. Okay. Are you zoomed in on Argus at all? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just just checking. Yeah. <laughs> 10 meters Only away from Argus. Moderately terrifying. Get the one out in front, in the 4K camera. See what's going on in bubble? I can't pull on that. That knot is stuck. Oh, I'll grab the other one then. That's what I was doing. I'll grab the one out in front. It'll break that knot. Okay. I was pulling on it pretty hard. Pull harder. Okay. <laughs> the half turn trick. Yeah. Take a half wrap. <laughs> Take serious? a half a wrap on your drop. More and more. There you go. Ooh. Okay, bye. Thanks, Kate. You want them both pitched? No, let's okay. just do one for now. I hate doing that with that camera right there. Anything to look at here, Steve, or keep moving? No, let's keep moving. Keep moving. Danny, good to go? Yep. Bridge now. Steve, is our go to go to four? Way back four. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're headed towards meters, four. Yep. Zero six four, and we can reduce speed to zero point three knots, please. Yeah. Uh, point three. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. Just keep moving, moving, moving. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to sample rocks for at least a uh, hundred more meters of vertical. Um, since we just sampled one, I'm trying to make somewhat uh, consistent sampling rocks across this feature. But we're just going to be looking at uh, you know, opportunistic zooms while moving uh, best we can. Sorry, I pulled you around there. It's OK. current here. That was a current that whipped me off down the hill. Hmm. Good current, little biology. Yeah. So about that. Strange.
need to pick those up and wait a little so it's an easier grab. <laughs> you think? I did that on purpose, just to challenge you. Did you? <laughs> so no, that's going to be a tough grab. I had a okay. question coming in for ROV. How far laterally can you move the ROVs at this depth without NAV having to move the ship? Uh, about 20 meters. Our effective operating envelope around Argus is 20 meters. If we get more than that, um, we pull tight on the tether, which pulls the Argus view off. Is the box bigger or smaller than the envelope? <laughs> <laughs> Zoom in there, Tammy. There's a, a bigger one of these bamboo corals just up slope a little bit. Really? Yeah. Well, we're looking at this one, too, man. <laughs> that one looks like a trufula tree from this perspective. This seems to be the most abundant uh, thing on this dive so far. It's uh, unbranched bamboo. We had a minute here to wait out of my envelope. Right, good captures. Yeah, you got that DSC, did you? We got a we got a screen grab of it. Yep. That's a good uh, still shot for the DSC too. I'm not moving. Mm -hmm. Yep, we got a few. Right there. Still have to wait for Argus. You can look at the one uh, a bit further up, if you want. It's uh, this guy just we? above the lasers there. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, and if you've got a, if you've got a lot of time, we can take a clipping of it. Ooh. We can. Ooh. You can since, stop uh, her up. Since it's one of these dominant characteristic species for the site. How about if we just pick up the rock that it's on? <laughs> I, I actually believe that would be a really good rock for a lot of people, but I think, uh, yeah. Have we done that before? Yeah. Rock with sample? Oh, that's my favorite way to sample. Biological sample plus geo geological. Okay, Sammy, you can zoom in. Especially when you have uh, sampling limits, either vehicle-induced uh, or for whatever reason. All right. Looks good. Is this going to be a snip and slurp, Steve? Or are you gonna yeah, let's do a snip pops? and slurp. Steve, uh, that gap right there, is that just predation, that gap in polyps on the branch? Yeah, I mean, something caused an irritation there that uh, resulted in settlement of this uh, solitary hydroid. Oops, mm -hmm. where's the pencil? Um, yeah, so there was some tissue loss here, resulted in this solitary hydroid, or maybe, th th so this is a solitary hydroid, but there might be a worm tube on here it's too. Um, that could be, um, yeah, just attached. Got it. But in this case, is, so this is not like parasitic. Uh, no? What happens here is, since these, uh, what are they called? Uh, Hyd uh, hydroids mm -hmm. kind of just feed off on this side. Th you can actually see that part of this is overgrown with tissue from the bamboo coral, so it's actually using that as bonus skeleton. What? Yeah. So it's using the associate as support structure. Yeah, the, yeah. so they're kind of building on top of each other. I, uh, I, don't, I don't see any polyps forming, but that doesn't mean they can't. Um, but there might be some I'm not sure if the hydroid really has much out defense against the, uh, the coral if it decides to put a polyp on that branch or something. The HD. So is this one going to be a snip and slurp or a That's what drop it in the sounds box? Like. That's what it sounds like. Um, you can put it in the box or slurp it, whatever you feel like doing front row. Come out a little further so it's in 4K. We don't have any slurps used. That's what's right. Nope. In fact, right. I don't think we don't right. have any biology samples at all yet. Nope. Yeah. 
more and more and more. Way up. I'd, you might come in behind it. Okay, there. Okay. Or up above it, one or the other. Well, one of the, one of the things we wanted to sample these sea mounts are site are uh, animals that are characteristic of uh, um, you know the site too. So if something is extremely dominant, we want to know what it is, so we don't have to keep guessing. Um, you know, if, if it's one species or another. Oops. Bamboo corals, though, we just we we have very is few that enough? precious. Yeah, plenty. Precious few species names for a lot of bamboo corals, so they often, uh, you know, we often collect them frequently, but still can't identify them to species names, or they don't have species names yet. Um, so all this work is going to contribute to that body of information. Yeah. Uh, uh, bamboo corals are just very, very difficult. Um, you know, you want to make sure that when you build your taxonomy of names uh, of species and how they're related, that um, you have there's a reasonable expectation that those names will stand and that you're, uh, you know, stand up to scrutiny of you know, both genetic and uh, morphological investigations. So it often takes quite a long time to formally describe and, you know, review groups like bamboo corals. There's been some progress made in the uh, past year, past year or so um, by uh, Scott France, um, Mary's advisor, uh, Les Watling, and others um, who have been working on revising groups within uh, a group formerly known as the Isididae, but now we refer to as the Corrado Isididae. Um, so a bigger umbrella, basically. Uh, and then within the Corrado Isididae, there are various different oh, smaller no, subgroups um, that have emerged, uh, different clades, as you might have heard us say, uh, based on similar shared characteristics. Um, In the jar. Nice. Second one? The problem has been over the past uh, 100, 150 so years or so. Yeah, it looks like. That uh, many of the species that have been named have. Uh, Fallen out all over the bamboo coral Only family one tree. Only in the jar. Um, oh. So, you know, <laughs> so that yeah. The, what? So Only one two pieces. Something called lepidosis yeah, one piece made it to might the appear jar. at several different clades and genetically, you know, d several different ways. One still on the slurp. Oh, okay. Still on the slurp. I guess it broke. Oh, it's okay. Uh, but there is one piece in jar one. Okay. I trust that it will come out. Oh, no, oh, they're both no, there. They're both there. Yep. Perfect. Oh, there they are. Awesome. All right. It's mosey. Mosey. Craft secure. Uh, but, yeah, a lot of the... So, taxonomy these days is... Uh, still has to retain a lot of the morphological techniques that um, have been... You know, that have established these large groups to begin with, but you know we're trying to slowly fold in molecular evidence to these uh, classifications. It makes it a more robust taxonomy, so you don't have um, you know, you know, groups falling out uh, where they shouldn't. But you know the, the problem is that even with the molecular stuff, uh, there okay, are. Okay, Sam, I can kick it in the gear. Right right even with the molecular data, some of the um, genetic information isn't Might always as conclusive as you'd like it to be. Uh, there's a lot of um, unique gene arrangements within uh, some groups, bamboo corals, specifically. Um, have some uh, arrangements that are differ from other octocorals uh, in their mitochondrial uh, genes, uh, mitochondrial genome. So uh, trying to understand their gene arrangements will hopefully help us develop better primers to sequence um, 
you know more deeply into some of these species. Hopefully, the goal eventually is to get you know, full genomes of most of these species, but it's still a little expensive to do that for uh, every collection. And then you also need to make sure that your your tissue is preserved in a way that remains high quality. Um, but for the most part, um, ethanol, 95%, or freezing, uh, or even drying, actually, um, tissue seems to be the most effective. Got it. Question coming in from the school group. Do the corals have floats? How are, how are they able to stand up? <laughs> The, mo most of the corals we've seen so far have a rigid skeleton um, underneath the polyps, and that skeleton is made out of various minerals of calcium carbonate um, from you know calcite, high magnesium calcite, and uh, some of the stony corals are, are aragonitic. Um, so different different groups of corals will have different. Uh, oh, what's down there on the sediment? Crab. Is that a hermit Something's crab? Something's moving. Got another Ooh, sea star there. What type of accessory does that hermit crab have? Oh, uh, it's one of those crabs. <laughs> Accessories. Oh, we collected one last year. Can you come up just a bit? I'm going to take a turn out here while we're looking at the crab. Yep. So, to answer your question, the corals have a rigid type skeleton that allows them to stand up. Yep. And it, it, in in the cases where some corals have um, lost or modified that skeleton to be uh, more proteinaceous in nature, it's still fairly rigid, but gives them some flexibility, uh, which is important. You know. Sorry, I thought I was going to be clever and take a turn out while I was pivoting around the crab, but I had to fly forward to keep the tether up. That hurt. sea star on the left looks like looks like it has three arms and regrowth. Mm -hmm. It Six. really does. Okay, Tammy, can zoom in there. Well, it's one of these. Uh, Hermit crab with a zoanthid on its back, kind of a zoanthid backpack. If you want, we've uh, we've sampled this in the past, uh, actually last year. Looks like they also have one claw larger than the other. Yep. Yep. Interesting. All right, great. Thanks. We've seen this a few times over the past few days. Uh, compare it with the other images. So when you sample like these hermit crabs, is it usually just sort of like a slurp technique? Yeah, I think that's what they tried last time. They tried to slurp it, you know, and if you slurp onto the gelatinous part of the zoanthid, you can you know, maybe get it all in the slurp and then dump it into the bio box, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the suction. Uh, rather than grabbing it, they tend to well, move away. But any, uh, basically this one um, ejected its backpack and uh, sacrificed the zoanthid the the one we sampled <laughs> last year, um, and the crab got a, the crab got away. Um, oh, but, the, but a great zo zoanthid sample for you, huh? Yeah, that we did. <laughs> what type of organisms uh, prey on the bamboo corals? Um, you're going to be looking at sea stars, uh, sea urchins, um, pycnogonids or sea spiders uh, have been seen slurping up a bamboo coral meal. Um, and then occasionally you'll get uh, these uh, small jellies that land on and you know, prey on the polyps. Uh, and then once in a while you'll also see um, aplicophorins, uh, those kind of worm-like mollusks. Uh, that'll curl around the axis of a coral and chew on the polyps. But those are most of the predators that I've seen. Okay. 
Overwhelmingly, it's usually sea stars, though. Do the sea stars kind of stay there and take the whole the whole colony down slowly but surely? That's a great question, and it's something we've been trying to find the answer to for a number of years. Um, you know, do they? You know, when they find a meal, is it like going to a buffet, <laughs> where they just you know they can feed until the colony is exhausted, um, or do they you know feed a little bit and then wait, hang out, <laughs> find another meal, wait for the the coral to regrow and then come back or something like that. Yeah. Um, we don't know. Most of them don't. Hard to get those type of observations with our snapshots, right? Yeah, it, it's really unusual because sometimes you'll see, you know, on a multi-branched colony, you'll see the sea star has um, eaten parts of all of the branches but left the branch tips. Um, or it could be that, you know, that the sea star feeds so slowly that they, I don't know, the coral just has time to grow that much. Uh, I don't think it's a fast process. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something we wish we could see in real time. Right. But we can't. Yeah. Has there ever been talk of putting down time lapse cameras? I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure there's been talk about it. It's, it's, uh, I think there have been instances where people have visited um, certain sites uh, with bamboo corals feeding repetitively, and they found that very little in there, Timmy. Very little is preyed upon from year to year. So we're talking probably about multi-year time scales, mm -hmm. and that stretches the um, limits of what our current technology can do. Another brown sponge. Yep, this one looks pretty not healthy. Uh, probably dead for the most part. What kills a sponge? That is a really good question. Um, we don't know. Uh, it could be predation. Um, and we know that sea stars do predate on sponges. The glass sponges? Yep. yep. Yikes. Yeah, um, we've seen. It's like eating crushed glass. I think it's Pythonaster. Pythonaster is the sea star. OK, thanks. That uh, preys on uh, sponges. But um, not sure. Um, we've seen instances, sea mounts before, where there have just been whole stretches of you know, dead sponges. So it could also be some sort of disease um, that spreads within it within a community. It's a nice iris there, Tammy. With the, uh, I got the mid lights off now. The sandy bottom. It uh, gets rid of that hot spot in Argus. Oh yeah, it looks a little better. Another 50 meters or so vertical, we'll consider another rock collection, but we'll have a bit, bit of time for that. Roger. Probably some way, somewhere between here and waypoint four. What did we say the, the white uh, contours are 25 meters? 50 meters. 50 meters, okay. So somewhere up near the next white contour, we'll start looking for a rock maybe. Roger. Strange place for this rock. How'd it get here? Mm -hmm. Looks like a rock we saw earlier this evening or morning. Have you ever attempted to pick up a large boulder like that? Like empty out her only, the only target was large boulder <laughs> to put on 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've pulled large ones onto the porch, but yeah. uh, the scientists don't like it because um, we don't either. It Can't see anything. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Amber. That's it. Yeah. And the chance then we have to recover with uh, power hot to keep the manipulators, you know, keep it pinned. And there's a chance of a giant rock falling off on someone during recovery. It's not, it's not that pretty. doesn't sound fun. No. Raining rocks off the vehicle while you're trying to put it on deck is. And then we have to, what do we do with it when we're on deck, right? We got this giant rock no one can lift. Like, can you move it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's usually when, uh, yeah, you need two people to go to the FedEx store to start lifting rocks, you know, something's wrong. It's a, I don't think it's useful either to have such big rocks, right? Do you really need can boulders? You get different what? type of information no. from yeah. a larger rock versus a smaller rock. We have uh, done it before, uh, not with this system, but they get um, what the scientists call pop rocks, so rocks that are formed in the mantle, and they have uh, glass on them, and there's um, gases fused in the glass. So they get this giant rock and they chip on it for days um, and get you know, maybe a couple ounces of uh, glass off of it, and it pops as they chip it, and the gas is coming out, and um, they take that back to the lab and grind it up and put it through a mass spectrometer or some other fancy gizmos, and they can uh, see what the uh, carbon levels and other stuff was back millions of years ago when the rock was formed. Yeah, they, you don't need a lot of material. Yeah, at, yeah, you could probably explain it better. Well, they get a atmospheric sample of <laughs> what life was like back then. Is that right? So we do take those pieces of glass, and you can polish them really thin so that they're optically transparent. And then we use um, an FTIR. So we essentially shine light through them and collect the spectra. And from there, you can kind of calculate water content as well as carbon dioxide content um, to help kind of reconstruct those conditions in the mantle. Wow. Yeah. That's some major science. And what, how, how, what's the, the time period that you're, like when that, when the rock was formed? When the so carbon was frozen? If you, yeah, so if you, use glass from like the surface of the rock that's going to be uh, more representative of when it was erupted um, and when that glass kind of quenched at the seafloor or when it came in contact with water um, if you use melt inclusions which are these tiny tiny little um, essentially bubbles of glass that are trapped in different mineral crystals um, so for example, I look at these in olivine. Um, those give you a better idea about what the water and CO2 concentrations were in the mantle um, because that glass gets trapped, that milk gets trapped um, prior to eruption typically. what was happening on the planet during that time? Is that like when the dinosaurs were traipsing around or before that? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends. Um, so if we end up dating the rocks too and the ages kind of coincide with those different events on Earth's surface, I guess you could say that that's, those were the conditions from that specific eruption area um, in the mantle at that time period as well. Looks like there's uh, some pink on the sonar. Yeah, it looks pretty steep. Yeah. Getting there. 
We're going uh, 0 0.3, but I don't know if you want to drop down. Coming up now, not too much. So yeah. now the bathymetry seems off in the opposite direction. <laughs> The last time we found the slope after we expected it, now we're finding it before we expected it. <laughs> Who made these maps anyway? <laughs> well, now well, I know we, where that big rock came from. Maybe it would be a, it would be interesting on our way out if we have time to map this uh, kind of dive track over because we've got a number of other gaps potentially to fill on this mm. seamount be interesting to see how off it is. Most of the bathy that we have for this seamount is actually from trans ships and ships in transit. Ah, so okay. um, yeah, this is not a survey necessarily. Um, but this seamount, the way it's oriented is uh, kind of on the track line from Hawaii down to uh, probably American Samoa points that way. So we have a lot of tracks that just run through along um, along that route. But there's, there have been some other surveys in this area since, um, so it's it's pretty patchy. Are these like uh, pillow lava that we're seeing here? Yeah, they're looking like some nice rounded pillows. I don't see any glass anywhere though. Does that mean they're... Yeah. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. It really depends. I just imagine like things that a geologist might have in their office, like a pillow, lava, beanbag chair. <laughs> I have a, a stress ball that's just a rock. Like it looks like a rock. Is it a rock? <laughs> <laughs> it is not a rock. See, that's that's that, that's how you make big time though you say people say to people this is a stress ball and it's a rock it's a rare kind of stress ball well <laughs> worry stones Market it. are a thing huh? you ever heard of worry stones no um, yeah i was introduced to them in like the uk and they're just little stones that you carry in your pocket and you rub them and you eventually have like a divot in them from your rubbing for worry worry stones. erosion at work is that yeah. is it supposed to be healthier than keeping it internalized <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, my understanding was that it was like more of a ancient thing huh. to carry. Not ancient, but through history, not a not something that was developed in these times. Probably more of a good luck charm than a worry. Little sponge. Oh yeah. Yeah. Then Most of these that uh, one looks sponges, healthier. Yeah. that one looks, yeah, definitely lively. Take a look at it if we have time. Sure. Oh. Quick question about the lasers. How far apart are they? 10 centimeters. Go ahead, Tammy. Euplectelid glass sponge, something in the family Euplectelidae. Looks like it has some associates. Uh, polychaete worm inside. Have we collected any of these? Um, I think they collected one yesterday. Uh, not not a whole sponge, but a fragment mm -hmm. of one. Uh, they thought it was a Euplectelid. On this one hasn't been collected. Yeah. Um, but this one is probably either uh, Euplectella or Regadrilla, one of those genera. We're just completing a move. Uh, do you want to be in transit for the watch handover? If I do a long step or do a shorter step? Ten yeah, minutes we left. We can be in transit. What time is it? Uh, 7.48.
50 meter step okay? Sure. Great. Bridge, Nav. Is that like the one Five we saw before? Meters that that city? City? Yeah, I think they're all the same. And I think we've been seeing it for quite some time to going down uh, at least to the start of this watch. So what is that, 2,700 meters? We've covered a bit of vertical distance, um, which is good. I think uh, we've only got about two or 300 more meters vertical before we're at the top of the, well, near the summit depth of the sea mount. But there's some interesting topography between uh, waypoints five and uh, four and five here. Okay, time to go. Four, five, Come and six that, that may show, you know, the top of the seamount usually has currents that might wrap around it, and so you might find higher densities of structure forming species like corals and sponges attached to the rock. Um, but sometimes on the slopes, yeah, I mean, we're kind of on a bit of the south southwest part of this uh, seamount, so usually it, where you have parts of the seamount that stick out. Uh, you sometimes have accelerated flows, um, so I was hoping to see more density of organisms in these uh, seamounts, but it seems pretty uh, sparse. Sparse, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, it, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a paradox to me why you would have such high densities of uh, of organisms in seamounts like uh, Johnston Atoll, uh, just a, fur a bit further north, or even around Hawaii, Northwest Hawaiian Islands, you have higher densities of things in the um, seafloor, corals and sponges, um, even though it's actually, in parts it's re more uh, oligotrophic, but down here it's even more sparse, but uh, not sure why. I know you're st you're, st you're getting wisps of equatorial upwelling up here, depending on how the, the eddies are forming and uh, um, you know, branching off of the uh, equatorial currents. You might have pockets of, of uh, productivity. Um, but it's a bit paradoxical why you would have uh, those those uh, high density corals and more yeah. nutrient poor waters. Are you referring to like the coral gardens and whatnot that? Yeah, have been imaged before. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a, there's some spectacular, uh, extraordinary densities of species like uh, corals up in uh, where we were conducting uh, our cruises last year in the Voyager Seamounts and around Chautauqua Seamount, um, Northwest Hawaiian Islands as well. Johnston Atoll has famous sponge gardens um, that have been found since. Uh, during the capstone expeditions of 2017, found some amazing high density sponge communities, including the, the ET sponge. The ET sponge. We yeah. haven't seen that one yet. No, I don't think it gets down this far south. Uh -huh. um, that was a pre ridge. Little bump. <laughs> Yeah. Out but again. if you tune in a little bit later this summer, in Ju uh, June and July, we'll be back out at Johnson Atoll with the Nautilus um, for the first time since 2019. Are you coming out on that one? I will be out on that one. All right. Me too. That so seems we'll, really we'll soon. Have, uh, <laughs> we'll have uh, two characters from the Arachnopho band out there. Nice. <laughs> Man, that's right. Our band's going to have to break up. This is short-lived. <laughs> <laughs> Members are going to be replaced. Feature in the rock there. Looks like someone was drilling a hole there. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes you see this where it just like crust chunks of the crust may either fall off or maybe it just doesn't it form in that spot. I'm not sure. Seems pretty crusty, but. This gives you some context to how thick these crusts might actually wow. be like that. That's probably several centimeters of you know, crust maybe on top of any possible underlying rock, maybe more. Did you Okay. Did you all see that thing moving on the rock? Okay. Come into the end of the watch here. What thing? Am I starting to see <laughs> I saw something and it like startled me. 
when we were zoomed in. Uh, oh, I think there's there a benthic a, uh, uh, siphonophore. Yeah, yeah, I, did, I saw that too. Uh, see? Benthic siphonophore. In between the Thermopelia. Rocks. I didn't see it. It was in, in the between middle. the two pumps. Yeah. yeah, it was just like a little ball. From First one, wow. Right at you the know, watch change. It's a siphonophore? Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, here, let me get that. Oh, I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> nope. You just had laser vision. You were seeing right through that rock. <laughs> I, I saw it, but I thought she was talking about something on the rock, and I was like, oh, I don't see this. Yeah. Push in a bit, Tammy. Ooh, I knew I saw something. Well, folks, we're coming at the end of our watch here. So Dan and the arachnophobe band are going to have to say goodbye, but the exploration continues. So stay tuned. Enjoy. As we continue to move up this, uh, this seamount and explore regions that have not been explored before. Okay. Until the next time. Five meters left on this move. Roger. Okay, Tammy, you can go wide. Wanna straighten the camera so then I can zoom. Zoom, zoom. So man does. Yeah, you there got we it. go. All right. Good. Swapping on video. Right there.
waypoint for. Okay, Nav. So we it looks. Are we in a? Got to move on. I don't we think. Just you're, completed a move. Just completed. Okay. ROV guys, good to go. Looks like they're settling in. Um, do you want to head up to here or just straight to wave point four? What was the other option? Uh, oh, over there. Local <coughs> uh, let's uh, let's go to waypoint four. Uh, but we'll keep our eyes open and check out may local highs if they look interesting. I think the uh, Steve mentioned that there might be a little shift in the bathymetry. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what we were noticing last night. Remember when we were on that sand flat and then all of a sudden the wall yeah. came up? Yeah, yeah. I think that, um, you know, we traversed over where it looked like there should be a wall, and then the wall came right after that point. Yep. So it might be off by about 50 meters. Yeah, so, well, we'll see what we have. It looks like we're coming up on an interesting steep area. But we'll go to waypoint four. All right, let's head out there. Bridge now. Can we get a 20 meter move, zero, seven, zero? We have a pretty strong current to the southwest. Okay. To the southwest. Pushing against you. Yeah, I'm having a full lateral starboard to keep it straight here. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was pretty strong. I think that's been, that was true for down below, too. Here we are, sand ripples again. I guess it's, uh, wait, sorry, that was wrong. <laughs> it's to the, uh, to the northwest. Okay. Yeah. Hello, Nautilus Live. Welcome to the 8 to 12 watch. I'm Jamie in the comm seat. Good morning. I'm Petruncio, watch lead. Coralie Rodriguez, and I'm back here in the science seat. Hey, Lonnie Sablon is data logger. Megan Putz, your navigator. Uh, Robert Waters, the herd pilot. Jake Bonney in the Argus seat. Dave Robertson, video guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, we're exploring the western ridge of an unknown goit, um, previously called Seamount D. Um, and this is the tail end of our dive, so we're hoping for some last minute <coughs> magic on here before we hit blue water. Yeah, well, oh, actually, we're, we're going to 20 hundreds tonight. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Yep, 24 hour dive. And, uh, barring changing weather. So, yeah, the weather's looking favorable. Tomorrow, maybe not so much, but, uh, looks like we've, we'll be able to complete this dive and, uh, then we'll see. Uh, tomorrow might be a mapping day for us. Uh, as the strong trade winds start to pick up again. But yep, we're going to try to make the summit of this seamount, or GEO, the flat top seamount, and uh, see what we got up here. There hasn't been a lot of biology. Uh, it's been easy to collect geological samples. How many rocks do we have, Data? About eight. We have eight rocks. Nice. Okay. Loaded down. Mm -hmm. We just, the challenge now, but keep them distinct, uh, yeah. yes. separate. If we get more. The boxes show that they're like distinct sizes, like small rock, large rock. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Might have to get more descriptive yeah. <laughs> as we go on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep. that's what yeah. we ended up doing. Let's <laughs> cruise like drawing yeah, sad pictures. pictures. We're like, this one is really triangular. This one has a funny little brown spot on it. <laughs> Before I knew that the lasers were spaced 10 centimeters apart, people were writing down like about 12 centimeters. And I was like, how do they know that? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone asked in the chat, like, what are the lasers for? And um, someone answered that they're 10 centimeters apart. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I feel so stupid. I should have known that. <laughs> I definitely didn't know what they were for the first time I saw them either. Yeah, but this was like 
at least two or three whole watches where I didn't know. <laughs> what did you think they were for? I don't know. I just thought they were like water lasers. Are you much in court? <laughs> Just to point at the specimens. Zero? Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, it could be a current. Yeah, it's like it's taking. Yeah, huh. yeah. That's what's creating these r sand sediment ripples. Also, it looks like the ship didn't hold, or they did a short oh. move. Oh, yeah. That might be what we're feeling here. Okay. Water rocks. So it's currently a little after 8 a.m. Hawaii time where we are. Um, I see we have some viewers from all over, so welcome. Hello, good morning, and good or good night, wherever you're from. And uh, thanks for tuning in. I think we're going to have an exciting watch. Yeah, we're going to find those high density, high diversity communities. Let's do it. Yeah, we're in a pretty good depth range to start seeing more corals, I think. Yeah, yeah, it should be pretty soon. But. <coughs> Negative findings are also <laughs> data. It's good exactly. information. <laughs> yeah, every time we dive, we fill in little gaps of knowledge that we have about where we might expect to find these types of communities that we're looking for. Um, again, we're, we're diving on that sort of southwest side of the seamount, which tends to have more sediment, so we see less corals. If we were able to dive on the northern side, I bet we would see better communities at this depth. But it could also just be, you know, the small point on this giant mountain that we happen to dive on. It could be that, you know, 50 meters from where we are, there's a de high density community, we're just not seeing it. You know, you never know. Mm -hmm. So what are you basing that north side hypothesis on? Uh, usually you have stronger currents coming from the north in this area, so it tends to have uh, a little more current for the animals to get more food, All right. Zoom in, sweep Dave. away sediment um, so they don't get clogged up uh, with sediment. Stronger deep currents, huh? Megan, do you want to move the mic a little closer? I think we're having a little trouble hearing you. I was just going to say the same All thing. Right, sorry about that. That's okay. I guess it's a good time for everyone to do a little morning mic check to make sure our mm -hmm. mics are in the best position possible. Not, no one's breathing. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't want to have that heavy breathing either. It's like... <laughs> Here's a little small bamboo coral. That's our favorite hermit crab. The Sympagurus with its little backpack of zoanthids. Can you explain why they carry the zoanthids around? So instead of trying to find a shell, uh, which can be very difficult in this type of environment where you don't really see a lot of shells, um, they have this zoanthid that grows with them. So they don't have to find a new shell as they grow, like some of the hermit crabs you might be familiar with um, in the intertidal zone. So it just happens to be a really nice relationship for both of them. <laughs> the crab carries around the zoanthid. Crabs tend to be pretty messy eaters, so the zoanthid gets food. Um, it gets to go to all the best places. <laughs> travel. Travel around <laughs> the seafloor. The crab gets protection because the zoanthid can sting, so things are going to be less likely to want to, you know, eat it. It gets protection because... Uh, Hermit crabs have a sort of reduced back end of their body. If you've ever seen one, um, it's like really small lobster tail kind of thing going on, kind of awkward. Um, so that gets curled up inside the zoanthid and protects that soft body. So it doesn't have that the hard plating on the back end of its body too, like you know your normal crabs. 
It looks like the zoanthid is almost outgrowing them in some cases. They get uh, like overlap. Yeah, some of those zoanthid zoanthids or polyps get really large, um, but that's okay because like in this ocean environment, it that's not very heavy to for the crab to carry around. I think one of my favorite things I've been learning about um, in these dives is like the amount of symbiotic relationships I've seen that I wasn't expecting between different critters down here. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a lot of associations and, and you'll notice those associations in shallow waters and on land too. It's just, you know, it seems to be even more apparent when we're seeing things for the very first time. We have a really good question um, on how we decide what samples to take and how many samples to take um, and the restrictions. Obviously, we're outside of the monument now, but there are still restrictions. So can we speak a little to that? Well, in terms of biology, um, we want to take things that are new to science that we don't know. Um, that way, we can describe these new species and um, learn a little bit more about the diversity in our deep sea. We're also looking for specific samples for students and researchers that are doing specific work. Um, Mary, for example, is looking at sparse branching bamboo corals. So we're targeting those animals for collection so that she can further her research. And there's also a a limit to how much we can collect. So mm -hmm. I mean, we've got quite a few rocks already. Uh, we have some weight restriction for coming back up to the surface. Don't want to get too loaded. Bridge nav. Can we make a 40 meter move, zero seven zero? And when it comes to the geological samples, we're also targeting specific samples um, based on the scientists that we have aboard with us and the research they're doing. And ashore as well. And ashore. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the three types we're looking for on this cruise are uh, rocks that could be useful for dating the seamount. Mind if I reset your DVL? Samples with... I was, that's why I asked. A good right. crust, a good ferromanganese crust on them. Yep. And some of these encrusted rocks uh, yep. Good go. that might be altered could be ex you know, where the it's not pure basalt uh, anymore. It could still be useful for microbial oh, yeah. studies. So little microbes living in that crust and uh, there's an there's interest in determining what services they're providing, ecosystem services, how they, what role they might play in the formation of these ferromanganese crusts. So we have Coralie Rodriguez on board, who is a ferromanganese crust searcher. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you're looking for and why? Yeah, so we're looking for ferromanganese crusts because there's kind of this renewed interest in them. Um, mm -hmm. They're highly, highly enriched and really valuable and economically important metals such as cobalt, nickel, and manganese. Um, and these are things that are needed as we transition to green energies and green technology. Um, and so we're looking at them because we're having trouble sourcing them on land or we think you know, our land reserves are being depleted. So naturally we have to look for other places to uh, start to find them. Um, but also these rocks form on really, really long time scales, so about one to 10 millimeters per million years. Um, so that means that we're also looking for maybe being able to use them for paleoceanographic uh, problems. So maybe if you can find a way to correlate the cobalt and the oxygen, which is a correlation that I've been able to find um, in my research and that other papers have been able to find, uh, then maybe we can say, oh, for this much cobalt in the crust, like, this is how much oxygen there was in the ocean at this time. And 
you know, this can be um, an indicator for how healthy or what the ocean was doing millions of years ago. Are you able to see layers in the formation of these crusts? Yeah, so you actually can see layers. And uh, ferromanganese crusts are interesting because there's two different forms that they can come in. You have iron oxyhydroxides, and then you have manganese oxide phases. And so each of those different phases will sequester their own ions to them. So the manganese phase is the phase that sequesters large amounts of cobalt. Um, but yeah, you can see the layers in them, and then especially, I think, for iron phases, you can see kind of red bands and stuff. This is a, this wait, a halosaur? You got it. Yay! This one. Oh, this one has little scales on his nose. Do you see them? Oh, yeah. Hmm. So this is a halosaurus. So cute. <laughs> well, he's going for a ride. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Are the currents very strong down there? Yeah, it's blowing pretty good. <laughs> You can see him drifting in the current. <coughs> yeah. It's easier not to fight it, I suppose. Facing into it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh. So at this depth, with a strong current, I'm going to go with uh, locally generated internal tides. If, if we were on the north side, as um, Megan was saying, that we could see influence of these internal waves coming down from the Hawaiian Ridge. On this side, <coughs> they'd be sheltered from that, but you could still have them <laughs> generated locally. Didn't even have to zoom. <laughs> <laughs> it zoomed for us. And for those who are more interested in the geology of this region and the people on board who are studying it, we have a new blog out on nautiluslive.org featuring Corley and fellow University of Rhode Island graduate student Rebecca Lippitt and their work and how it relates to what we're doing. So I highly suggest you check that out. Yeah, and I'm not holding brisket. Yes. <laughs> it's not a brisket? It's not a brisket. All of the comments are, what like, what recipe did you use on this brisket? <laughs> this looks like good brisket, and I've never seen someone look at brisket this way. <laughs> it's a ferromanganese crusted rock. Find <laughs> someone a lot longer to make than a brisket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Find someone who looks at you the way Coralie looks at rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, last time I did brisket, it took all day. <laughs> but did it time. take a couple million years? Well, in, in it felt in, like it. In brisket <laughs> anticipation time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Like a million win. years. Came out good though. So Jake, we have someone asking about uh, why Argus is part of the dual system and it, and um, the purpose that Argus serves, especially in related to Hercules. Do you want to touch on that? Sure. Uh, we use Argus it to uh, basically decouple the ship's motion from Hercules. So you see Argus bouncing up and down in the Argus view. That's what the ship's feeling at the surface. And Hercules basically floating still. So we get those really clean shots of uh, biology, geology, whatever we want down there. Um, and then Argus also, you know, we outfit it with a number of cameras and sensors, uh, provides the pilots with kind of a, an operational perspective of everything going on. Um, and then you, it's also just, you know, it's really cool to see 
uh, Artagina sense of perspective on the environment uh, around Hercules. Because Hercules is a big vehicle, it's about the size of a car, and it really does look small down there around the large cliff faces and uh, you know, massive corals that we come across. That's true, it does look so much smaller on screen, and then when you see it on deck, yep. it's quite large. So another question we have is, uh, how do single ROV systems defer operationally from dual ROV systems? Um, so the, the advantages of a single body system are that you can uh, pick up heavy loads with the ROV directly and it, the launching is and recovery is an easier step. You can go up into a docking head and so it takes less people to, to launch and recover them. Uh, it's, uh, what are the other advantages? The disadvantage of a single body system is because of the steel cable going right to the vehicle, you have to put a series of football floats on the, the, the main umbilical and sort of float it down near the, the ROVs. And that it helps decouple the the, all the ship's motion, but not completely. So a lot of uh, single body systems will have a, a heave compensator that that moves with the ship's motion and tries to, you know, cancel it out. Has Herc always been used with Argus? Um, we also have uh, Atalanta, which is a the little little brother of uh, yeah. Argus, <laughs> and <laughs> or a little sister, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we can operate Herc with that as well, or instead of. Yeah. And we also have a little Hercules. Yeah. Which is similar to Hercules, but can go 2,000 meters deeper, but does not have the manipulator arms to help take samples. Yeah, it's an observation ROV. Pretty useful to see, to have a set of eyes around on Herc to see what's behind or is next to it. Absolutely. I think especially because the perspective of the steepness is way different looking at the two cameras. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're just going with just what Herc has for cameras, you know, you just kind of like having blinders on. You don't see <laughs> yeah. what's going on to the sides and mm -hmm. the, the Argus view, you know, you're looking at a much broader field. Which can come in handy when there's giant hydroids behind you. Yeah. <laughs> it's like looking through a porthole versus looking off the monkey deck. That's a great metaphor. For those familiar with the monkey deck. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have a deck on the above the bridge really nice place to go and get a 360 degree view of where we are. It could be a bit windy up there at times, but great spot for stargazing. If we're on DP, if we're on our, we're on our dynamic positioning system during a dive and it's calm, you can go up there and have some quiet. It's a good place for sunsets. Yeah. Yeah. I like to read up there. It's quiet. It's oh, peaceful. Nice. And bird watching, which I used to enjoy. 
Used, used to. <laughs> <laughs> Your opinion of birds has changed? <laughs> I was told we cannot speak the name of such species any longer <laughs> upon this ship. <laughs> the Scottish play version. Oh, here's an interesting question. Who names the ROVs? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> uh, herc has been around for some time. Yeah. There's been other generations of, of ROVs prior to them. There was Angus, and there was uh, Woods Hole as Argo. And what else was there? That's all I know for now. I don't know why they're all the Greek god names, but... Maybe it's the sense of adventure that comes from those myths. Oh, like fish. Yeah. Wow, it made tracks. No fish. Oh, huh. fish, fish pieced out. <laughs> oh, there he is, still there. That's kind of a pretty rock formation in the middle. Oh, he's in there. Yeah. He's, he's hiding in the rocks. So. Oh, yeah. I see. Right, <laughs> zoom in, Dave. Sneaky fish. A cusk eel? Yes, it oh. is a cusk eel. Two for two. You're getting all those IDs. I'm doing amazing. <laughs> What's the main way to tell them apart? Dorsal fin, and this one has a big head, and the other one doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. <laughs> and does he also have scales on its nose? Yeah, this this one will have scales, but uh, the the difference with the uh, the scales on or off the nose is only for halosaurs. Okay. This one is a uh, Vasazetus. So its main characters are that it has sort of a roundish, blunt head with very small eyes. <laughs> it's so cute. It's kind of cute. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. eyes. It's the best look at the eyes I've seen. Yeah. Like a little Halloween fishy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They look like little tadpoles. Yeah. Okay. Okay, stepping along. Should be encountering some steepness soon. Bridge down. It's like pretty rocky to the left. Yeah. Oh, patches of rocks. Yeah, looks like we're Can coming we make a 20 meter on move, on zero yeah. seven zero. Yeah. Yeah, we might be <coughs> finding that steep area right now. Yeah, that's why I'm making a shorter move this time around so we don't get surprised. Emma, we have someone asking for more explanation on deep sea currents, where they come from, and what makes them different from surface currents. Do we have time to talk about that? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> So the deeper currents, <coughs> the deeper, the steady currents that are very slow are, are driven by differences in density of the water masses. So then that's determined by the temperature and the salinity of the water mass. So that deeper circulation is referred to as thermohaline circulation. So we'll have warmer waters around the tropics, colder waters in, uh, near the poles, where they, the ocean gives up its heat to the atmosphere. <coughs> this water becomes chilled and dense enough to uh, sink. So we form a, a North Atlantic deep water up near Greenland and Iceland. And that sinks down and starts heading south in the Atlantic. In the Southern Ocean, there are spots where we form Antarctic bottom water that most dense water mass in the ocean. And that will sink and spread out into all of the ocean basins. 
Um, so that's what you're going to find on the bottom. Uh, very cold. I don't think it's as salty as the North Atlantic deep water, but it's more dense because it's colder. Uh, and so those, those water masses will slowly spread out. And the way we've, we were talking about that at breakfast with uh, Mark, I think he participated in some of these cruises to detect the tracers, the radioactive tracers that we know were deposited from the atmosphere at a certain time. And that Wally Broker at Lamont Doherty, I believe, the Earth Observatory, part of Columbia University, uh, came up with the concept of this global ocean conveyor belt to explain the recirculation of the ocean waters from the surface down deep and that upwells in various, the, the deep waters are brought back to the surface in various spots around the world, upwelling, coastal upwelling, um, and then in the past two, two to three decades, we become aware that steep bathymetry, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the East Pacific Rise, the Hawaiian Ridge, these areas where you have steep bathymetry play an important part in bringing that water back to the surface and mixing it because you have these, the tide interacting with these steep features generating internal waves and that helps to mix the ocean. It's like a certain, where you have rough bathymetry corresponds to where you've got a lot of mixing going on. That's the only way we, the really important way to mix that deep water up. Otherwise, we'd have very warm at the surface and then a rapid drop off to cold water with depth. But what we see is something more gradual. Gradual decrease with depth because of that mixing that occurs. Um, so yeah, there's s very, very slow steady currents and then there's these periodic oscillations generated by the tide that are faster uh, that you could measure with a current meter. You wouldn't have to, you don't have to rely on tracers like you have to do with that thermohaline circulation. So th and every, all the surface currents are wind driven and the deeper currents are driven by density differences or this stirring by internal waves in a, in a nutshell. Thank you. Uh, sure also, thing. an FYI, um, for hailing halite is the mineral salt, table salt, NaCl, um, and that's, so that's why we use hailing for a lot of oceanographic uh, terms. So you also have the thermocline, which is uh, how water temperature changes with depth, then you have the picnocline, which is how the density changes with depth, and then you have the halocline, which is how the salinity changes with depth. Oh. Yeah. I saw those too. There's one down there too. Yeah, there's that one. <coughs> what are you looking at? In the oh. housing. It'll be inside on the inside lens. Yeah. Oh, the bubbles. Okay. Or drops. Now, can we make a 20 meter move 070? All right, thank you, Emil. Um, the bridge says that there are some rain and wind, uh, shouldn't go over 20 knots, but just to be aware, okay. That would be coming from the um, east-northeast, which, so if the ship is pushed by them, that'd be in a good direction for us. Yeah, yeah, that's Safe the, also the direction we're heading. So the ship shouldn't have any trouble holding 
and moving. EV Nautilus is named after the Nautilus, which is the name of the ship in the um, novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, published in the late 1800s and written by Jules Verne. So at this point, Corley, you're pretty satisfied with the crust samples that we've gotten on this dive for yeah. these for these depths. Yeah. Well, yeah, these look pretty uh, sedimented as well. Yeah. If we see a really good one, or I think we're still looking for angular rocks. Sure. Yeah. I think that's what we'd keep an eye out for yeah. at this point would be the angular ones. And then hopefully they have a little bit of crust on them that I can use. So yeah. Dual purpose. Yep. I guess if we uh, can't find an angular rock, finding one that looks highly altered uh, for Beth Orchid uh, to break off a piece for her to look at the microbes. Still with a good crust, yeah. Yes. Which I think all of these are yeah. pretty crusted. But we can wait until the end of the dive to... Yeah. We don't want our eyes to be bigger than our <laughs> ROV boxes. <laughs> Bridge now. And make a 20 meter move, 070. Oh. Ooh, cucumbers. It's like party. Huh. Mm -hmm. They come in so many different colors. Yep, they sure, certainly do. Lots of pinks and purples too in the they see cucumbers of the deep. Oh. Ooh, Ooh an anthemastis. So this is called a mushroom coral. And if we were to disturb this mushroom coral, you'd see why it's called that. Um, when it retracts, it retracts its polyps. Um, it kind of looks like a little mushroom from Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> there's something on it? Yeah, there's, there's a small crustacean. This is one of the coolest ones I've seen, I think. Yeah, I like these. They're really fun. Very interesting the way they they branch out at the end. Yeah, so that's how you know that this is an octocoral. So each polyp has eight tentacles, and those tentacles are pinnate, meaning they have those side little branches. And every octocoral has polyps that look like that. But they come in various sizes. So anthemastis have, have these really large polyps. 
but things like uh, Chrysogorgia have really tiny polyps. Oh, there's that crustacean. Mm -hmm. It blends in. I think it's a tiny squat lobster. Oh, like a cute. little baby one. <laughs> it looks a little like Munidopsis. And they usually get pretty good, like, like fist size. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if that's what that is, it's a very, very small one. likes to climb trees. Yep. Well, you get a lot of protection in there. You're not going to have, you know, predators coming by to, you know, try to get you inside all of these stinging polyps. Yeah, looks great. Thank you. We notice a lot of different bright colors down here, which is surprising considering how dark it is. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in about that. Yeah, so color seems to be one of those things that a lot of people uh, are surprised by in the deep sea. And color in the deep sea isn't necessarily important because it is dark down here. Um, but certain colors can be really advantageous, like being red. So I notice a lot of things are, are red in color or purple or shades of red. And that's because red is the first color of light to attenuate in seawater. So that means that if you're red, you're gonna be more black than something that is say blue or green or yellow. And that's why red is uh, usually the chosen color for a lot of deep sea organisms. That color is also useful for waking up the watch team. <laughs> it's, it's, it's looking at these two-tone seascapes can get pretty mesmerizing. Yeah. yeah, when you bring your own light down here, you're just like, oh, wow, this stands out so much. How <laughs> could these creatures hide? Yeah. Um, but this is more light than this area of the ocean has ever seen in the entirety of history. So being red down here is actually the new black yep bridge now can we make a 20 meter move zero seven zero thank you There's a little fuzzy bit on that rock, sort of brownish looking. Yeah. What are we looking at? I think this is a rock pen. So this is a sea pen that's specialized to suction cup onto rocks. A lot of times when we see sea pens, they're rooted in sediment. But you'll notice on this one, the, the peduncle, the base of this coral has sort of like a, a wide suction cup looking structure and that allows it to attach onto rocks. So we often call them rock pens. There might be something on one of the polyps. It's like yellowish. I can't tell what that is. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's all you guys has. Yep. Yeah, whatever it is, it's real oh, small. Yeah. Hmm, it's really interesting. I'm good here. Okay. Someone is asking if we have um, experienced any squid living down here. Oh yeah, squid live down here. But they're also very fast and smart, mm -hmm. so they don't usually let us see them. They see us coming and they say, nope. <laughs> yeah, they probably hear us coming. Hear us coming. We're very loud. We have another question about marine migration and whether it happens um, this deep. And I remember, Megan, you mentioned that a lot of the migration is actually vertical. Yeah, so the vertical migrators are a bit shallower than where we are. Okay. Um, they tend to stay in this uh, midnight zone layer around, you know, 500 to 700 meters, and they'll come to the surface at nighttime and they'll go back down to their safety zone during the day. Um, down at you know 2,200 meters where we are right now, uh, the organisms down here aren't vertically migrating. They're gonna be staying at these depths, um, living out their lives. There's something in the sediment over there. Yeah, it's an umbulula. Oh. Or what do you call it, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> So this is uh, another type of sea pen. So this one actually roots in the sediment. Um, and I always remember the name Umbalula because it looks like an umbrella. All the polyps are gathered near the top. That's really advantageous to this animal because it gets it up off the seafloor into areas where there's going to be more turbulent flow, bringing more food for the animal to feed on. So Steve would like us to keep an eye out for that type of rock pen again uh, for a sample. Okay, absolutely. Fridge now. Can we make a 20 meter move, 070? What do you think for sampling a rock pen, a slurp? Yeah, I think the slurp might be the best. Um, I'm not sure how strong they attach to the rocks, though. Yeah. Could scrape it off. Yeah, you base. might you might like want to nudge it and then and then slurp it. But they are very fragile looking, so we want to be careful. I think if we puncture the tissue, it might deflate a bit. Meredith Everett says they will pop right off fairly easily. Okay, cool.
So the sea pens that are anchored in the sediment, how do they stay put? So they have this um, long bit of its uh, stalk that extends underneath the sediment and basically anchors it down into the sediment. So there's actually more sea pen underneath the surface of the sediment. Oh. And do they usually stay where they're anchored for long periods of time? Yeah, yeah, usually they stay exactly where they're set. Um, they don't really have the ability to, you know, swim or move around freely. Some sea pens, though, can retract themselves back down to the sediment. We learned that on one cruise uh, trying to collect a couple sea pens and they went bloop. You right learned down that the hard way? <laughs> yep, and it disappeared. And you're like, wait, what? What just happened? Might be a Chrysogorgia on that rock. You see, right where the lasers are, there's a pink pinkness. And an acorn worm, yeah. Yay, interrupt. Noose are so fun. <laughs> so this is a Chrysogorgia coral. And it's got a little squat lobster in its branches called Europtychus. You almost always see the squat lobster Chrysogorgia association. This is a really cool acorn worm. Yeah, the ones I've seen are more purple. Uh, yeah, the maroon. Yoda. But this one doesn't look like the the Yoda genus. Nice. So that's actually a genus name, Yoda, because the, the person who named it thought it looked like it had like ears like Yoda. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got to have your Star Wars fans out there represent. <coughs> I suppose it's no different than naming it the Dumbo octopus. Yeah, but like this is the scientific name is Yoda. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's a hardcore fan. I, I don't know. Those are both Disney properties, so, you know. I think, they are. I think it was named before Star Wars became Disney. So I recall reading somewhere that the acorn worm is a distant ancestor of vertebrates. I think it's got a uh, notochord. There are eggs ah. in this, the branches of this. I wonder what kinds of eggs those are. It's not from the squat lobster. Fish? Uh, yeah, maybe some sort of fish. <coughs> Does look like a row. <laughs> That's cool. That's a really neat observation. You don't see that very often. Yeah. Yeah, Emil, I, I think I remember that as well about acorn worms is that they they have a notochord, so but they kind of fall under um, other phyla, so they're not in the chordates. Hemi, hemichordata. Hemichordata, yeah. Sister group of the echinoderms. They're real weird animals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they give me vibes like the movie Alien. <laughs> that. Oh, a bamboo coral. 
This is an unbranched bamboo. Was, every time I see a bamboo now that doesn't look like it's got too many branches, I'm like, will it be sparse branching for Mary? Bridge now. Can we make a 20 meter move, 070? Um, I'm good. So this was sampled earlier, Steve says, no branching as far as they could tell. Yeah. Does no branching mean different species? Of we don't know. Oh. Yeah, so there are a couple theories on the sparse branchers, um, one being that they could be unbranched bamboos that get some sort of damage, and then it just sort of spurs the bamboo to grow a side branch. Uh, the other thing is, like, maybe they are different species, and, and that's the kind of questions that Mary's trying to answer with her research. The bamboos are particularly difficult to identify, and they're still working out identifications for a lot of them. Um, they've been doing genetic uh, testing on them to see how related they are, uh, classifying them into clades. But it's a very difficult and diverse group to study. Uh, the bamboos have also recently been spit, split into two families. So they used to be the Isididae, and now there's the Isididae and the Cratoisididae. So the Cratoisididae mainly makes up all the deep water um, bamboo corals, and the Isididae are mostly the shallow water ones, but then there's like a couple that don't fit into that description, so it gets a little complicated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ten minutes ago. Sure. So we use Niskin bottles to sample water at very specific depths. Um, and then we can test the water samples for various things. And I think one of the cool things we're looking at in it is eDNA. Um, I think it's like a relatively new thing, but we have some scientists ashore who are specializing in it. Yep, yeah. Meredith Everett is with us on the science chat. It's her area, so E for environmental. The DNA from material that is left behind by organisms that pass through or live there. So we collect those over um, areas where we've got a good diversity of corals. Can we look uh, at that branchy bit? And on we, the we left can side. hopefully build up a good database. Are we hoping for sparse branching right here? Yeah, maybe. Looks kind of sparse. It does. Looks kind of bamboo y. There's something beyond Go it. Go for too. a zoom, Dave. Oh, yeah. Well, it definitely is a bamboo. And it only has three branches. Um, trying to see if it's just been damaged. Yeah, yeah I it think looks like it's, it's just damaged. damaged. Yeah. yeah, so it had a lot more branches in the past. So the that base. doesn't really meet our description of a sparse brancher. Okay. I think there was a paragorgia off to the left too. Yeah, there was something wide, else up there. There's like a paragorgia. A red right. coral right there. there yeah. Okay. Let's see. So Steve was saying the polyps here, on that other one we were looking at is similar to the previous, but branching. So now you can see why bamboos are so confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you can have um, 
bamboo corals in the same clade that have multiple <coughs> different like branching forms. They can be unbranched, they can be like really branched. We used to think that bamboos are either nodally branching or internodally branching, but then we found some that have both. <laughs> so we're like, oh wait, now what? But this is a paragorgia, a, a bubblegum coral, called such because of its pretty pink color and at the ends of the branches, the polyps gather into these sort of little balls that look like bubblegum. Yep. And then is this a snake star? Yep, it is a snake star in the branches. So a lot of times we see snake stars uh, associated with bubblegum corals. Are they a type of, type of brittle star? Or is it just like, are they like related? Can I make a 20 meter move, 070? Thanks. Yeah, so the um, the snake stars and the brittle stars are in two different groups, but combined, Dave. they um, are distant really related to one another. And how long do bubblegum corals live? Um, I'm not quite sure, but uh, they do live long lives. Um, and it also depends on the species. So further north, uh, they can get quite large. Um, usually down at these depths uh, in the Pacific, we usually see them, you know, decent sizes, uh, but no more than like a meter, but uh, they have, like, up uh, near Alaska, dredged up bubblegum corals that, you know, are six feet tall. So, oh, wow. that's crazy. So they can get quite large. And, and that's mostly